Thank you everyone for joining. We'll begin our program shortly. Thank you for joining. We'll begin our program shortly. Thank you everyone for joining. We'll begin in just a minute. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our last event of 2021. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mariah Nationalis Tafoya, and I'm a senior production associate here at the council. I'm excited to be joined today by our president and CEO, Dr. Jerry Green, as we review the foreign policy events of 2021. Today, we will not only discuss the events that occurred in international affairs, but also take the opportunity to reflect on the Pacific Council's year and what members can expect as we prepare for 2022. As a general reminder, please remember to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit questions throughout the conversation. Towards the end of, end of Jerry's remarks, we'll turn to the audience Q&A. Um, and so please just submit those anytime throughout the conversation. And with that, Jerry, I will go ahead and turn the floor over to you. Um, Mariah, thank, I, I still see you, not me. Is that as it should be? Or? Oh, oh, yes. One second. Let me just. Okay, oh, there, there we, we go. go. <laughs> Wonderful. Very good. Thanks. Thanks, Mariah. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I, um, I, I'm delighted you could uh, uh, join us. This is not Royal Way. This is Mariah and, and, and me. Um, and I thought, um, we thought in, in developing our programming that this was sort of a good opportunity to sum up where, where we are globally. This is um, you know, an extraordinarily interesting time in, in, in our world, in our business, and one that is, is, is full of uncertainties and, and, and to some degree peril and dangers. I, I think we find ourselves at a, at a, at a very difficult uh, moment. I'm gonna spend 90% of the time talking about what's going on in the world, 10% talking about the Pacific Council and what we're gonna, what we can expect uh, next year. And then um, Mariah will, will, will direct questions to me. Um, I assure you, I will not be able to cover everything. So if you have a burning desire to talk about Syria, which you should, cause it's really important, um, you know, or, or um, Mexico or something, by all means ask. So I just have a, a list of, of things that I suspect, uh, I more than suspect, I, it's rather obvious that it's keeping um, the White House awake at night and our allies around the world. And these are not in, in, in uh, an order of importance because they're all important. Uh, the first one is, is, is Russia uh, menacing the Ukraine. And um, again, what people don't understand is, or some, you know, we, our members would, but civilians may not, is although Ukraine is, is not a member of NATO, um, it falls within the NATO sphere of concern, sphere of influence. And what's going on in Ukraine is, in a sense, a battle um, between the Russians and the West, and particularly the United States, about the independence, the autonomy, and the future 
of, of Ukraine. Um, 100,000 Russian troops are massed on the border. Um, the intelligence says that, that certainly should Russia wish to invade, they are equipped to do it, they're positioned to do it. Um, the United States has made it very clear uh, that it will not respond militarily, uh, but it will respond aggressively and massively economically. And, you know, rather than my telling you what's going to happen, which I don't know and none of us do know, I think one thing we can, we can be certain about um, is Putin is going to continue to stoke this fire. Um, if I were Putin, I would not invade. Um, I would just have the attention of the world um, on, on him. Um, I would keep the United States and the West off balance, uh, but I don't think that, that an invasion you know, makes a lot of sense for him because that sort of literally pulls the trigger for the rest of the world to, 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 to respond. So sometimes doing nothing is, more pow is, is a more powerful way to do something than doing something. And if I were Putin, I would just, you know, I would, I would, you know, just play this out as long as I can. I'm not Putin. So, you know, and, and, and lots of people have lost lots of, you know, sleep trying to, trying to predict and figure out what he's going to do. But this Russia, Ukraine, Russia poised to invade Ukraine um, is, is, is enormously, um, it's an enormous concern. Second is Afghanistan. And Afghanistan, I describe as the right policy disastrously executed. Um, you know, the shambolic way in which this was held, uh, in which this was conducted, you know, often overshadows the fact that this is the right thing to do. Uh, the United States certainly should have exited um, from Afghanistan. My concern and the concern of many of our allies is we could have done it better. Interestingly, and this is Jerry Green analyst speaking, um, this is one of the areas in which the Trump administration and the Biden administration are pretty much on the same page. There are certain areas um, in which the Biden administration is doing pretty much what the Trump administration would have done. Both sides hate when I say that, nobody likes to admit it, uh, but the reality is that both Biden and Trump correctly in my view um, sought a withdrawal from, from Afghanistan. What was the problem? A, we did not, not only did we not consult our allies, we never even informed our allies. And right after this was happened, right after this happened, I was at a meeting in the UK with a bunch of um, foreign office officials, and they were outraged, outraged that the United States had not bothered to tell them uh, that we were withdrawing and, 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 and defining the nature of the withdrawal. Second of all, um, it would have been a very simple matter to get everybody out of Afghanistan that we wanted to get out and then give up Bagram Air, Air Base instead of doing it the other way. Um, Bagram certainly would have allowed us to, to bring out anybody we wanted. It was, it's a secure, it was a secure air base, not that far from Kabul. Um, we could have you know, put people on planes from, from Bagram and we didn't. So these are the two, the two issues. It's the right policy, it was badly executed. We should have consulted our allies and we should have done it differently. And this continues to sort of haunt uh, the Biden administration. The third and clearly the most important and long lived of all of these um, is China. Um, US Chinese relations are the worst they have been um, in, in memory. Um, and um, China is just engaged in, 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 in um, sort of global um, muscle flexing in a way that's aggressive, in a way that's provocative, in a way that, that sort of flies in the face of, of, of what's expected from the international community. And in some ways, it tends to be divisive. Just to enumerate, and I can't go into all these in detail, what's going on in Hong Kong, um, is clearly un unacceptable, uh, menacing, continuing to menace uh, Taiwan, policies of genocide um, in Xinjiang towards the, you know, towards the Uyghurs and other Muslim peoples in China, the Belt and Road Initiative, which seems to be foreign aid, but it's foreign aid of a particularly self-serving and in many inst instances um, destructive sort um, with, with the Chinese. Um, and then all sorts of things. I mean, the Chinese were, were close to building what was thought to be a military facility in the United Arab Emirates. 
And the United States called the Emiratis on this and the UAE, you know, quite prudently canceled the, 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 the program at the, last, at, at the last minute. But the Chinese are everywhere. Um, I was watching the confirmation hearings of um, a member of our board, Dr. Cynthia Teas, who has been nominated to be ambassador to Costa Rica. And she performed brilliantly and was prepared to be grilled by um, various senators on China. Who would think that when you're being uh, sent to Costa Rica, uh, you're, most of the questions would have to do with China and China's role in, in this hemisphere in Central America. And that's the, the reality. Uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which the United States created and then foolishly, in my view, chose not to participate in. China, um, somewhat mischievously, except it's more serious than mere mischief, is, is seeking access to the TPP, which is, is just mind boggling. Um, China is sending a million, a billion doses of vaccine to Africa. I don't know if they'll work, but it's, it's, uh, they are nonetheless doing it. And what the United States finds itself doing um, is, is, is sort of playing catch up um, with, um, with, with the Chinese so that you know, we will roll into town and tell the African countries or the Latin American countries, stop dealing um, with China, but, but we really have not provided them you know, a viable alternative to China. Um, I can't remember, we, we, last week, one of the Central American countries, um, I, I'm not certain which one, um, broke relations with Taiwan because you know, the Chinese importuned them uh, to do it. So China is a serious, serious problem. Um, there have been um, adaptive security arrangements being developed, which I think are really important. The first is the Quad. Um, the Quad includes the United States, Japan, India, and Australia. It is not a, a military alliance. The Chinese, you know, belittle it and make fun of it, which means they're concerned about it. And if, if, if you sort of look at the Indo-Pacific uh, region, um, India, Japan, the United States and, and Australia aligning themselves certainly has a great deal to do uh, with China. AUKUS. AUKUS is, a, a, um, again, a good policy poorly executed by the United States, in my view, but it's an arrangement between the United Kingdom, the United States, and Australia to provide Australia advanced nuclear submarines to provide degrees of security um, in, in the South China Sea and, and, and regionally in a way that makes very, very good sense. The problem with AUKUS is Australia had a, a submarine deal with the French. Um, the United States didn't tell the French, elbowed the French out of the way, made the deal, and the French were extremely unhappy with us, as you know, properly they, they should be. Um, the United States probably should have given the French a heads up that this was happening, but France got us back because they just, uh, um, concluded a large airplane uh, deal with the United Arab Emirates, uh, the Rafale um, fighter along the F-35s, which we're sending. So China, you know, makes its, 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 its presence felt um, everywhere. It is a major challenge to the United States. The United States would like its policy to be all China all the time. I mean, they really want to focus on China, um, but things like, you know, Afghanistan and other things get in the way. On the next of the Iran nuclear negotiations, we are still negotiating sort of with the Iranians in Vienna, but the Iranians won't talk to us so that we and our partners are talking, our partners run over to, you know, the Holiday Inn or something where the Iranians are staying, you know, and there's a lot of running back and forth with messages at the same time, the Iranians have, have, have kept their nuclear enrichment program alive. And, um, I, you know, to say that the negotiations on life support suggests some hope. Um, I, you know, question the utility. I supported the JCPOA the first time uh, when the Trump administration um, got rid of it. I thought that was a mistake. But, you know, going back in history doesn't work. And, and, and it's quite clear that the Iranians have, have um, equipped themselves to withstand major, major economic sanctions. Um, if I were sitting in Tehran, why would I make a deal with the United States when the United States just broke the agreement, one administration broke the agreement that the prior administration had made? So why we think the Iranians 
will do this um, is, is, is a mystery to me. So the negotiations flounder. And why do I mention this? Because areas of, of, of treading water activity in which we're doing things and we're not achieving our goals really undermine our ability to operate globally and makes our allies as well as our adversaries question our efficacy. Uh, the next one is um, our southern borders um, with Mexico uh, remain in flux. There are periodic massive movements of people through the, the Triangle of Central America, up through Mexico uh, to the US border. Um, the, the US has is, 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 is shown itself uh, still struggling with this issue and trying to figure out um, how, to, how to deal with it. So this is a major, major issue in terms of our relationship um, with, 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 with our Mexican neighbors, um, to a certain degree with, with Central America and, and Vice President Harris just, you know, has been dealing with this in the last few days. Um, and it's a domestic political event. It's a domestic political event. Some local law enforcement in places like Texas are dealing with, with migrant issues, which is a federal issue, not a local law enforcement issue, but it's a way to sort of put a thumb in the eye of, of the United States government by saying, that this needs to be dealt with um, locally. The next is, is global challenges to democracy, global challenges, and specifically in the United States. Um, the challenges to democracy are growing. Uh, democracy has shown itself to be frail, not only around the world, but in the United States. The United States just had a two-day democracy summit, which was, I think, you know, not to change anything, but to sort of signal um, you know, the importance of democracy, you know, obviously there are some challenges. So the Democratic Congo, you know, Republic of the Congo was at the democracy summit. Uh, Hungary was not for good and obvious reasons. But so, you know, the messaging is, is positive. Um, you know, I think the United States, frankly, needs a, dem a democracy summit on the fate and future of democracy in the United States. The specter of January 6th still um, haunts us. And um, there are a variety of, of, of voter suppression activities, uh, voter manipulation, electoral manipulation activities. There are things going on in this country um, that bring into question not the survival of democracy in our country, I hope, it's certainly not existential, but certainly the efficacy, the prosperity, the effectiveness, the ubiquity or ubiquitousness of democracy and so forth. And I think, you know, we, we need to be aware of the fact that democracy in the United States is not doing as well as it should. Climate change is a major, major threat still. Um, and, and, and um, you know, we have um, Senator, um, former Secretary of State John Kerry as the, as the climate change czar. Um, as much time as we devote to this, uh, we need to devote as much time and get the rest of the world on board and get the United States back into the game because we took a sabbatical from um, addressing climate change, which was, was costly, which was costly. Um, the next is global supply chains fitfully, you know, are, are readapting to a, um, to a changing world. Those of you who are at, at Policy West um, had um, an opportunity to hear two of the most important people in the United States, Mario Cadero, the head of the Port of Long Beach, and Gene Soroka, the head of the Port of Los Angeles. These two people, their ports control 50% of the imports, or close to 50% of the imports into the United States. And the, the global supply chain issues are affecting all of us, are affecting all of us. So this continues to be um, a problem and uh, a serious one. Uh, energy prices remain high. Um, we did, uh, President Biden did release some of the petroleum from the strategic reserves, um, which drives the price down a little bit, but that's only a temporary solution. Um, you know, the, the cost of energy is, is, is uh, important. Um, and in part because of this and other reasons, the ugly specter of inflation um, is back. I mean, inflation has not been this high in the United States in, in, in decades. Um, and so this has a ripple effect throughout the entire economy. And this is a domestic issue, but it's also a global issue. And then um, finally, um, um, COVID. Um, it, COVID has this, this, this remarkable, you know, uh, staying power. It keeps mutating. And every time, you know, people think we see a light at the end of the tunnel, 
uh, it now looks like the light at the end of the tunnel may be another, may be another train. Um, we, we don't know. Um, I was recently in the United Arab Emirates. I was recently in Qatar. These were two separate trips that I, I, I took for you know, um, Pacific Council related reasons. Um, it was comforting to be in a place where people wore masks and there are very high level, very high levels of vaccination. Um, you'll note, you know, I'm saying comforting as opposed to, to being in Los Angeles where you know, people are not agreed on this issue. There's no discussion about this in the UA in Qatar. Everybody is, is vaccinated, everybody's wearing masks and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's become normal. So the whole, the whole notion of, of, uh, of, of COVID, not only as a public health issue, but also as it relates to the practice of democracy, people that are opposed to vaccination, you know, that whole debate um, is, 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 um, is important. One of the things about the Pacific Council um, is, is our sort of belief in what we call local to global. There is nothing that, back in the day, there, was a, there were domestic issues and there were international issues. It's quite clear with the passage of time that that distinction no longer exists. So many of these things uh, that we think of being domestic really aren't domestic, they are global. The rest of the world is watching, people are paying attention, and you can be sure um, people are talking about smash and grab um, robberies in, 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 in Los Angeles. A very distinguished member of the diplomatic community whose nationality I will not reveal, but this person is a consul general from a very important country, uh, was, was robbed at gunpoint outside of his home uh, in Beverly Hills. People followed him home um, and they robbed him. And, and, you know, and this is a, 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 a very important diplomat. So sure, that's a local issue. Beverly Hills PD needs to do its thing. Um, but at the end of the day, the foreign ministry of this, you know, the State Department in Washington apologized, which, you know, is nice, but that doesn't, you know, make this person and his, his family sleep any better. And then this person's government had to provide private security to ensure the security of this person and their family. So this is local, you know, smash and grab, you know, the, the robberies we've all been reading about, um, the, 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 the brutal, horrific murder of, of, of Jacqueline Avant and, and, and all of these things, these are not global, glo uh, local issues. These are global issues. And it's important to, 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 to sort of think of them as such. Um, the final thing is, is, and I'm going to stop here. I, I see Mariah looking at me, so I want to um, open it up for questions. And I'm going to end where I started, and then we'll talk about the Pacific Council for one second, um, is we have elections coming up. We have elections in 2022. Um, there are, and then there's a presidential election, you know, not that far down the road. Um, the, the eyes of the world are on us. Um, the, the confidence of our allies and the concern by our rivals is not what it used to be, in part because there's uncertainty about what the global role of the United States is. Is US global leadership important? Some think yes, some think no. Um, these are important debates, they're interesting debates, but the eyes of the rest of the world are on us because this is really an inflection point in US history and global history. Okay, uh, before I open it to questions, what can we expect to see from the Pacific Council in 2022? Um, Policy West was a huge success for us. We had great speakers. We had more pe um, um, people show up in person than virtual attendees. People flew to Los Angeles from around the country to attend Policy West. It was very, very encouraging for us that you know our first foray into in-person programming seemed to work. Um, second thing we want to, and so we will be doing more of that. We will be having a gala in May, um, which is long overdue, and uh, we're hoping that will be primarily in person. Uh, we will see, um, you know, what 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 LA looks like. We want to begin our trip program, our, our our global delegation. We have three members that are candidates to be ambassadors: um, Mayor Eric, Gar member Mayor Eric Garcetti. Uh, to India, and his confirmation hearing was held this morning in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He did really well. I hope you all saw it. I was watching it live. Uh, Dr. Cynthia Tejas, um, ambassador to Costa Rica, 
Mark Nathanson, former chair of our co-chair of our board, has been nominated to go to Norway. As is our practice, we will send delegations to visit our members at post after assuming they are conf confirmed and when they get there. We also are going to start visiting military facilities the way we've done before. Our members love to, you know, kick tires and 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 uh, visit military facilities. So I hope our delegation program uh, will be up and running. You know, depending upon. Um, I mean, I've been traveling globally a lot, and as I say, I felt better in Dubai than I do in L.A. But not better. I felt, you know, less exposed to to you know pandemic issues than I than I do here. Um, our veterans group is, is going to be up and running. Um, we have a lot of veterans in our membership. And what's different here is that veterans are see, as seen as a source of wisdom on international affairs. You want to talk about, you know, Iraq, it would be nice to make part of the conversation American military people that have served in Iraq. Um, so we want to bring our veteran, we want to give our veterans a, a, a bigger voice and the sort of policy conversations and analysis that we do. And our definition of, of veterans is very broad. It's not only uniform military, it's the intelligence community, it's law enforcement. I mean, the FBI knows a lot about international affairs. It's, they're not just about robbing banks and, and uh, stopping the robbing of banks. And in our membership, we have veterans from you know, every three letter agency you can manage, local law enforcement, and of course, uniform military. So stay tuned for that. We have a modern diplomacy uh, initiative. This is um, part of our, our interest in subnational diplomacy, Los Angeles representing itself globally. Um, you know, things like sports diplomacy, health diplomacy, commercial diplomacy, citizen diplomacy. The Pacific Council is deeply engaged in, in, in all of these. And these are very, very powerful tools. Um, LA is going to have the Olympics and hopefully a primo role in the World Cup, which is being shared between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. I mean, this is the sports mecca in the world, and it's a very powerful diplomatic tool, sports. Um, we have a program called Amplify, which is to help younger people who are non-traditional um, 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 international affairs practitioners enter the world of international affairs, join, you know, the foreign service, join, you know, the intelligence community, join businesses that are doing things internationally. This is a unique Los Angeles capability. Our Guantanamo Bay Observer program is back, is, is up and running again. We're going to start sending people to observe the trials at Guantanamo Bay. Our Mexico initiative is, is doing really well, and we have a project led by uh, Dr. Richard Downey, uh, and Kathy Lynn Austin, two of our members, on helping to stop the flow of illegal arms to Mexico. And so, and it's part of a broader Mexico security project, which we're doing with our partners in Mexico City, Comexi. Um, the Mexico initiative is led by Michael Camunos, a member of our board. So in terms of the Pacific Council, um, the world is giving us lots of fodder to, to keep us busy, and we are keeping busy. Um, and we're simply trying to, you know, to, to, to do what we can do within the realm of, of what's safe and what's secure and what our members expect. So with that, I will stop and Mariah, ask away. I will happily answer any questions our audience has. Great. Thank you so much, Jerry, for artfully um, summing all of those things up. I know that when I was thinking about what was happening this year, there's so much and you really touched on on everything that was on my mind. So uh, I hope it was just as um, informational for our audience as well. Um, so we have a question here from Steve. Um, he asked, in the case of Afghanistan, what would have happened if the US had handed over weapons to Afghan civilians instead of the Afghan government? Uh, there would have been a civil war in which the civilians would have lost. Um, it would have been a bloodbath. Um, you, you know, it's it's, uh, it's a very interesting question, Steve, by the way. But, you know, um, being military requires, you know, not simply having a trigger to pull, but having some, some training. And in many ways, the Taliban might have welcomed this because it would have allowed them to impose order even more brutally and to, you know, portray those who oppose Taliban rule as agents of the United States, agents of, quote, Western imperialism, um, and so forth. So it's an interesting question, but uh, um, it, would not have, it would not have gone well for the, the people of Afghanistan who have already suffered enough. 
Great, thank you. Um, and just as a reminder to the audience, please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A function at the bottom. As we wait for more of those to come in, um, I had a question, Jerry, about, so you mentioned our security relationships, especially in relation um, to China, such as the Quad, AUKUS, um, and we've really seen Biden move towards reestablishing diplomatic relationships um, and reemphasizing multilateralism that you know, was not done during the Trump administration, rebuilding that. How key um, do you think these relationships will be moving forward as um, we seek to you know, address a lot of these global challenges and become um, establish ourselves as a global leader again in the diplomatic space? You know, the Quad is a very interesting, creative idea. Um, and um, we had an event on the Quad actually um, um, a few months ago with representation from um, Australia, Japan, and uh, I think we had somebody from the State Department. Um, the Indians were not able to participate because it was really in the thick of, of COVID. And the best way to deal with China, in my view, is not, you know, is, 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 is not for the United States to unilaterally uh, or bilaterally, you know, be in, in conflict with the Chinese. It's to develop global coalitions um, because many countries are threatened by, by this, this new um, resurgent China, uh, not some, simply the United States. But it really is not easy. The United States is boycotting uh, the Olympics, not the athletes, but the United States government. The EU is not willing to do it. Um, and what's so interesting is the Chinese um, can be very, very beguiling. Um, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is very, very well capitalized. And for example, China owns 10% of the port um, capacity in, in, in Europe. Uh, China came very close to buying the port of Haifa in Israel, which, you know, the United States, this is like the UAE example I gave earlier, the United States stood up to this and say, you know, this is probably not a good idea because American naval vessels refuel in Haifa and we, you know, we, we simply don't want to be there. So um, what we're now having to do is not only police China, but police the good guys, our allies, in order to see if they may not be tempted to engage in ways with China that in the short term are very appealing to them, but in the long term um, can be really disastrous. The Australians absolutely get it. The Canadians get it. NATO gets it. I, some of you were with me. Uh, we were together at, at, at um, visiting NATO headquarters, seems like 100 years ago. It was before the pandemic, three years ago. And I asked General Scaparati, who at the time was the head of, um, um, he was the SAC here, the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. I said, sir, do you think about China, which is not a typical NATO question. And he nodded um, and he said, all the time, all the time. Um, for Dr. Cynthia Tass to be grilled on China, talking about her ambassadorship in Costa Rica. This is a global issue. It is a global issue. And so AUKUS, the Quad, you know, trying to get others to support us in boycotting the Olympics and so forth is really very, very important. And frankly, there are not huge differences between the way in which the Trump administration saw this issue and the Biden administration. I mean, obviously there are gonna be differences in execution, but China's China. The United States is still the United States. And for us, it is a major, major concern. Of course. Thank you, Jerry. Um, so our next question is from Frida Glukoff. She thanks you for your remarks and says, do you believe we should provide COVID vaccines and become more active in the distribution to the world? Um, as you know, we, you mentioned these, are, it's global and not local that can be used. I mean, these can be used as a diplomatic tool um, at, for vaccine distribution. Well, first, hi, Frida and hi, Joel, wherever you are. It's nice to virtually see you. I don't see you, but it's nice to know you're there. Uh, I'm not that, you know, I'm, I'm a PhD. So uh, whenever I'm on airplanes and, you know, the flight attendant says we're looking for a doctor, unless something's having a philosophical breakdown, I'm not the, the doctor to ask. But since Frida asked, um, what we've learned from the pandemic is, is, is disease does not recognize borders. And very early on, 
the Pacific Council uh, was advocating um, vaccinating anybody and everybody on both sides of the Mexican border. If you show up on, on the Mexican side and you're from Honduras or Guatemala or Mexico or China, we should be vaccinating because it's, it's, it's not only protecting them, it's protecting ourselves. And, and these things uh, do not recognize borders. What I hear regularly, and I believe it, is really the only way uh, to mitigate uh, the pandemic is for universal vaccination. And I don't know how to do it because it's not my, my, my area, it's not my field, but it is in the interests of the planet, therefore the interests of the United States, uh, to make vaccine available to everybody everywhere. When the new Omicron came, uh, appeared, we immediately stopped flights from eight African countries to the United States. And it's said now that was done a little bit prematurely, but at the end of the day, um, if we vaccinate everybody, the planet will be a safer place and we will all benefit it. Some physicians, and I can't, I don't have the expertise, were saying instead of giving boosters, we should be giving that vaccine to people that hadn't had their first shots. I, you know, I don't, I can't adjudicate that. But I think that just the way climate change is a global issue, a lot of these public health issues are global issues as, as well. Um, and so, you know, my answer to the question is we should be vaccinating. The story I love to tell is the Cleveland Clinic, which has a very large facility in Abu Dhabi. Was I was talking to a friend in Abu Dhabi. I said, did you get vaccinated? This was really early on before we were getting vaccinated. He said, oh yeah, I got vaccinated at the, at the Cleveland Clinic. I said, really? I said, you know, what, what, what was it? Pfizer or Moderna? It was the Chinese vaccine. <laughs> so the Cleveland Clinic was administering the Chinese vaccine. So this is, you know, the, the specifics, you got to lead to a real doctor, but this is a global imperative, a global imperative. <laughs> Yes. Um, thanks, Sherry. Agreed. I think that vaccination is something that, you know, it's crazy that here in the U.S. that we have more available and people not taking vaccinations while other people around the world um, don't, don't even have that available. So our next question is from Omair um, Khan, and he says, in dealing with the Russia and Ukraine situation, is, important, is it important for the U.S. to de-escalate in a way that Putin can save face and not look like he's backing down to threats? And if so, what are some ways to do that? You know, I, that is a, Omar, thank you for a spectacular question because I think a lot of, I won't play the pedantic professor that I, I am and go into a lot of history, but our relationship with Russia would be better if after we had won the Cold War, we had been more attentive to then Russian um, you know, considerations, culture, feelings, and not, you know, been this victorious winner, but rather had been an ally. You know, fast forward today, absolutely. If we can find a way to de-escalate, we should do it. But I don't think Putin is looking for de-escalation. I really don't. I, and I think if, you know, if I were Putin, I would keep this revved, I wouldn't invade. I would just, you know, have the specter of invasion looming and, and, and create as much uncertainty as, as, as I could. But so I like your question. I think we should strive for that. But the Russians are, are you know, um, Blinken, um, Secretary of State Blinken just uh, is on a trip to Southeast Asia. He landed, I can't remember where it was, in Kuala Lumpur or Phnom Penh or, I think, no, 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 Jakarta. And who's in Jakarta when, when, when Secretary of State, State Blinken lands? The number three foreign policy official of Russia. Uh, we didn't even know, uh, the United States didn't know he was in town. They will not be meeting, but this guy kind of showed up stealing to a certain degree Blinken's thunder in, in, in making his appearance in Jakarta. So Russia really is, 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 is playing a, a very dangerous game, but they're playing it, you know, from their perspective, pretty effectively and pretty well. And we need to figure out how to deal with it in their in lies the greatness of your question, Omar, which is to try and figure out how to de-escalate um, and learn lessons from the Cold War. Great, thanks. Um, so our next question is from James and he asks, what is your assessment of the situation in Israel and also about Israel's current relations with other countries? Well, that's a, you know, big question, James, but, you know, let me, um, 
Um, Naftali Bennett, the new prime minister, just made a state visit to Abu Dhabi, to the United Arab Emirates, Abu Dhabi, just yesterday, um, which is really, really interesting. Bibi Netanyahu had hoped to make the trip. Um, COVID got in the way, and then the Emiratis didn't want to host Bibi, as a, you know, which might have been perceived to strengthen his, his, uh, um, his um, uh, electoral fortunes. Uh, the coalition government that nobody gave a snowball's chance in, you know, in the Sahara, a chance of working in Israel, um, actually appears to be working better than anybody ever anticipated. Uh, the Abraham Accords, which again, let us be fair, um, you know, we are in Southern California. This was a Trump administration accomplishment, you know, and, and the Abraham Accords, everybody loves it. And so, um, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge that we're in such a hyper politicized world that, you know, it's inconceivable that, you know, somebody can say something good about or constructive about both sides. So the Abraham Accords actually um, are an important first step. Uh, the big thing in Israel now are destination weddings in Dubai. Uh, weddings are expensive in, in Israel. If a Jew wants to marry a non-Jew, they have to marry offshore because the, the rabbinate, which controls marriage, is, is a religious body. So I, you know, the number of Israelis showing up in the UAE is, is remarkable. And I like that. It's normalization. It's normalization. It does not obviate the need to the Israelis to deal meaningfully with the Palestine question. Um, this should be, Israel should regard this as an opportunity to deal with the Palestine question, not an excuse to avoid it. And I think they're using it as an excuse to avoid it. So, um, you know, Israel is just a remarkable place. I mean, there are more publicly traded comp Israeli companies on the stock exchange than any other country in the world, um, but it's, it's, it's never boring. It's never boring. Sorry, James, that was kind of quick, but that's a little country, big, you know, big issues. Yes, of course. Um, so our next question is from Moira Shoury, um, and she's actually asking about um, your media consumption habits and like what uh, you recommend, like what do you watch, read, and listen to um, to get your information? Huh. Um, well, I obviously read the Pacific Council magazine. I, you know, that sounds very commercially, and so, but I do. But um, you know, our, a lot of our members produce really interesting stuff and we curate work by our members so this is a good opportunity if any of you write anything that's you know that's that's it's it's published you know as an op-ed or professional journal send it to us we'll we'll put it up on the website because you know we our success comes from bragging about all of you and i'm th th that i am serious about um in terms of media i you know i I do a lot of reading and not a lot of watching um you know i read the economy it's interesting i read the economist um, I listen to the BBC in my car every day, except I'm not in my car as much as I used to. So I kind of miss hearing the BBC as much as I do. I am a voracious reader of the Los Angeles Times, which people make fun of me. And, you know, um, there was a great story in the LA Times three days ago about an Afghan, a young woman's Afghan orchestra that escaped to Doha. And what you might not all know, but I know is the the LA Times person who lives in Beirut who wrote the story is named Nabi Boulos, and Nabi Boulos is a classical musician. So for him to write, and, and, and the reportage of the LA Times from Afghanistan was spectacular. The LA Times really hung back when a lot of others bailed. So I don't, you know, it's not only the LA Times. I read the LA Times, I, the Washington Post, uh, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, New York Times, LA, and I read all of those every day. And then other, you know, inside baseball, political science -y sorts of stuff. But to be candid, I don't do a lot of watching. I just don't find it uh, um, particularly informative. And you should all know that the Pacific Council is part of USC. Our home is within the Annenberg School of Journalism. So I am a pushover when it comes to, to journalism. I just think journalism is, is the heart of what we, you know, we do as, as, as analysts. So thank you. Interesting question. Yes. Well, that's all of our questions from the audience. So, Jerry, if you'd want to make some final remarks before we go ahead and wrap up. A final remarks is, is everybody on this call is, is, is a member of the Pacific Council or somehow involved with, with, with us. 
Um, what makes our lives, and I say our, you know, um, you know, Mariah, me, our, our, our entire staff, really interesting is if you make demands on us, and not, not, you know, not that we're going to meet them, you know, we should have a three-day conference on, uh, on Kyrgyzstan, we're probably not going to do that. But we really like to hear from our members, we really like to, and I will give you a divide, a lot of the older members tend to like you know, formal events, speakers and so forth, which I like as well. A lot of our younger members are looking for a more tactile, hands-on um, experience. So they may be less interested in events, but they're more interested in projects, things like Amplify, the Veterans Group, and so forth. Um, I think we can do both. I mean, that's, that's our, our aspiration, but we only know if we're getting it right or wrong uh, when we hear from you. So feel free to, to communicate with, uh, with us. I, a lot of times, I, you know, we'll get somebody who goes to the president's alias, which is not my, you know, mine is jgreen at pacificcouncil.org. And then there's one president at. Uh, so the president, when I don't see, it always gets forwarded to me. I never not respond to, mem to messages from members. We're not that big. So we still are able to, to do that. So um, we provide a really valuable service, I think. Uh, we are in the game. We are not observers. That's why I was watching Mayor Garcetti's uh, confirmation hearing this morning, as I did Dr. Cynthia Teus's, as I will Mark Nathanson's. Um, I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're in the game. You know, one of our former colleagues is the head of the Office of Presidential Personnel at the White House. And suddenly I'm a celebrity because I know him and everybody wants to meet him. And I never, you know, I never agree, but so th this is not, this is a team sport, but it's not an observer sport. We're on the field. You live in Los Angeles, you're on the field. And I could give all sorts of examples, you know, just looking, I, cause I can see who's on the call, but I will resist the temptation. So let me end um, thanking you, Mariah, for setting this up. Thanking our members for, for, for joining us. Thank you for staying the course during the pandemic, which made life very difficult uh, for everybody, let me wish you all a healthy and happy holiday season with a big emphasis on the healthy part. And we will see you in 2022. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for joining this afternoon.